But his vision from the Lord is what gives him direction. If we have vision, we have direction. If we fail to have vision, we lack direction. And so if someone doesn't have direction, like if they don't know where they're going, right? It's, it's because they don't have vision. And also, too, another thing with, with direction is a lot of times people say, I don't know what I'm supposed to do. I don't know what I want to do. And the, the issue with that is not what you're supposed to do or where you're supposed to go. The issue is that if you don't know who you are, you don't know where you're going to go. So when you discover who you are, it becomes more natural to know where you're going and what you're going to do. And so anyway, Paul goes to a woman's Bible study. They're, they're literally down by a river, and he meets a woman named Lydia. Now this woman named Lydia was a female businesswoman. She was a fashionista. She traded purple silk, and uh, she was from a place called Thyateria, which is a city in Asia Minor. She was wealthy. She was a business owner. She was a woman. She was an entrepreneur, and she was of Asian descent in a Greek city, all right? So he, he goes to this women's group, they're hanging out by the river talking, and then he begins to use the scriptures to, to convince them that Jesus is the Son of God, that Jesus is the Messiah, that Jesus is everything they're searching for, right? So then he goes in and there's a, a Greek girl. Now she's a slave, she's poor, she's broke. She has a spirit of divination, she's demonic, and she keeps on harassing Paul every time he goes places. And um, so Paul casts the, the devil out of her, and then the slave masters, basically the people who owned her, were, were not excited about that because they were extorting her for money because they were making money off the spirit of divination. She was like a palm reader, right? And so, which you have on Bergen Line, right? So this is very real to us, right? This isn't just far away, this is right now, this is reality. So she was a palm reader, and she was moving in a demonic way. The devil was using that gift and exploiting her, and so she was a Greek slave and she was broke, all right? Now, then you have, and when Paul gets thrown in prison, Paul and Silas begin to sing in Acts 16, God shakes the prison, the jailer is getting ready to kill himself with a sword because he knows if prisoners escape, it's, it's, it's his life. He's responsible for those prisoners. So as he's getting ready to stab himself with a sword, Paul says, stop. Paul leads that guy to Christ, leads his whole family to Christ. So the foundation of the Philippian church is three different people, and God reaches these three different people three different ways. They come from three different ethnicities, three different uh, socioeconomic realities, and they probably had some different type of religious backgrounds as well that were different. One was a spirit of divination, one called Caesar Lord, and the other one was a seeker. We, we don't really know what she was religiously. We know she was from Asia, which was full of idolatry. So you have basically an idol worshiper, a totally demonic person who's totally demonic and is exploited by the devil and then you have someone who works for the system he works for the man he, he calls you know Caesar Lord and so he submits to Caesar so you have a Philippian jailer who is Roman you have a Greek girl obviously who's Greek and then you have an Asian woman who was a businessman so she was wealthy the Greek girl was poor the Philippian jailer was middle class and um, God with reason reached out to the woman Lydia and, and, and he reached her through her brain, right? And through the, 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 the girl who was demon possessed, it was the power of God that God demonstrated his power, demonstrated his kingdom, and through the demonstration of God's real power in real time and space, uh, that girl got, came into the kingdom of God. And then the Philippian jailer saw a true kingdom example. He saw someone who actually put other people before himself. So Paul was concerned that this man uh, did not kill himself. Many of us, if the jail broke, would have broke out, we would have broke out of there, we would have ran with the quickness, I would have ran. Paul was more concerned about that man's life than his own freedom. So his example, the example that someone else saw, is what brought that man into the kingdom. All right. So that's where we stand. Now, Philippians was written from a jail cell in Rome between 60 to 64 AD. And um, now he, we're going to go to Philippians 3 and we're going to get into this. But he, he, he starts with a very interesting word. He starts with this word, finally. That's the first word of chapter 3. Finally, my brethren, 
Rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in spirit, rejoice in Christ Jesus, and have no confidence in the flesh. Though... I also might have confidence in the flesh. If anyone thinks he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Now, circumcised the eighth day, the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But the, what things were gained to me, these I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed I count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is of the law, but that which is through faith in Christ." But that's not, see, I'm reading from the New King James. That's not what it says. Now, this is the problem with the New King James. The New King James says, faith in Christ. So that implies that my faith is in Christ, which is what is the power to save. Wrong. It is the faith of Christ, which means that the faith that I have is because He has faith. What does that mean? That means that we're saved by grace through faith, which means my faith and my response to God is simply a, is simply a, a very small bit of, of reciprocation for all that He's done. So my faith in God does not originate in me. It originates in Him, in what He's done, and what He said. That's important. Um... And be found in him, not having my own righteousness. I'm going to read 9 again. My own righteousness, which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ. The righteousness which is from God. See where it's from? God, by faith. That I may know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering, being conformed to his death, if by any means I may attain to the resurrection of the dead. Now, in verse 1, finally is Paul's first word. And finally is Paul's ending before his ending. You ever hear a preacher say, I'm getting ready to stop. I'm getting ready to close. I'm getting ready to finish. Right? If you've been in church any time, you know that they say that and then they keep going. Right? So that's the same thing Paul's doing. He goes, finally. But finally implies that there's something that he's wanted to say and he's about to get into it. You ever, you ever sit with somebody and you're talking with them, but you got something, you know, you got some, you got some, you know, in your hand of cards, you kind of have something that you kind of want to throw down, something you want to say, but you're like waiting, waiting. That's kind of like the flow of what's happening. Paul is like waiting. He wanted to communicate a few things, but then he comes on another level and he warns them, right? See, the first chapter is about the gospel. It's about our, our fellowship is in the gospel. It's about our conversation, our behavior should be according to the gospel. Our lifestyle should be a reflection of the gospel, right? And, and so it, it's, it's very gospel-centered, right? So then you have the second chapter of Philippians, which is very Christ-centered. It's about the supremacy of Christ. It's about Jesus. And then you have Philippians 3, where he ends up, where, where, the, where the middle and the meat of it all is about Jesus and about knowing Jesus and it's about experiencing Jesus and then he finishes it all with the coming of the Lord but before he gets into his middle right he he wants to communicate something to them that he's concerned with and and he's 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 concerned and so this is what he says Paul tells the Philippians to rejoice in the Lord Paul's life was proof that the joy of the Lord is not subject to the circumstances that we find ourselves in. He is in a jail cell telling them to rejoice. Which means his circumstances is far worse than theirs. And in a Roman jail cell was cold, it was dark, and he only ate if people brought him food. So he, he was in, he was not in Bergen County Jail. 
He was not upstate where they, they lift weights and, and, you know, they watch TV. He was in a dungeon type place that was dark and cold and from these terrible, bad situation circumstances that were a result of him doing the right thing and him doing good, he gets thrown in prison. By him opening the jail cell and, and, and letting uh, a, a girl who is oppressed by men and a, a someone who is victimized by literally oppressors, by her casting the devil out of her, his reward was he get thrown in prison. And sometimes we don't realize that sometimes when you do the right thing, you actually do get the wrong results. Now, in this verse he tells us uh, why he's writing. He says to them, he says, I'm not writing to be irksome. Irksome is like our language. I'm not writing to annoy you, but I'm writing so that you are safe or that so you are secure. He warns them of a group of people who, was, who are called the Judaizers, right? And, and this is what this group of people did. They were Jewish people, right, who began to believe in Jesus, but what they began to do is they began to mix the old Jewish stuff with the new Jesus stuff. And they had this one premise basically that said to be saved from hell, to be saved, you would have to be circumcised. Now we laugh at stuff like this, but they were trying to corrupt the purity of the gospel. See, the purity of the gospel is we are sinners. We are messed up. We need Jesus. When we acknowledge that, when we accept that, when we believe that, when we embrace that, we are saved. I don't have to go to church. I don't have to, um, you know, I don't have to get circumcised. I don't have to, like, cover a bad tattoo. I, like, when you're saved, when Jesus saves you, it's His work in saving you. It's not your work. The only thing you do is when He throws the rescue net, you just grab hold of it. Right? You're drowning. You know, think of it like this. We're drowning. You know, we're, we're in the Hudson River. And to be saved, all you have to do is when He throws the net, just grab hold of it and let Him pull you to shore. That's all you got to do. He's doing it. It's His strength. It's His power. It was His effort. But you have to recognize you need it. You have to accept it. And so Paul was concerned that these Jewish people were, because of their ethnicity, corrupting the gospel and taking away the purity of the good news, which is, it's not what we do, it's what Jesus has done, right? And so he was, this was a big problem to him. Like, he wasn't okay with this. He wasn't like, okay, I understand where you're coming from. He's like, this is what he calls them, Paul the Apostle who wrote the love chapter, love is patient, love is kind, you know, everyone quotes that. This loving man called these people dogs, evil workers, the concision or the mutilation, which means flesh mutilators. <laughs> now, um, when he calls them dogs, he's saying, to, he's saying, which is really an unclean term, because remember, Paul was a Jew, right? So for him to call them dogs, Dogs eat what is unclean. Dogs are scavengers. He's saying these people are only out for themselves. He calls them evil workers, the concision. And then he says this, we are the circumcision. This would be a very inflammatory statement to a first century Jew. Paul calls Greek Gentile Pagans, that's what Greek, the, the Jewish people would look at these people as if they're second class citizens. Right? Like, really. So, when Paul says, we are the circumcision, this is inflammatory. This is revolutionary. This is, like, these are fighting words. Like, these are not just, oh, you know, come to church, you're such a nice person. He's talking straight, and he says, we are the circumcision. And, and that's, that's not cool to a first century Jew. Because the covenant, right, that God made with Abraham was in Abraham's flesh. Remember the circumcision? Hello? Are you guys with me? So, so there is this, this whole circumcision thing in days past had a profound meaning. That meaning was directly from God himself. 
But now God is saying, okay, all the types, all the shadows, all of the promises that were in the Old Testament are totally fulfilled in Jesus Christ. So then it doesn't become about me going to the temple. It doesn't become about sacrifices. It doesn't become about keeping every single rule because Jesus knows you're going to break it. It becomes about faith in Jesus that comes from Jesus to you. All you have to do is reciprocate and give it back to him and say, yes, I acknowledge. Yes, I believe. And that acknowledgement, that position of humility saying, God, I need you, that activates the supernatural power of God in your life to totally transform you and make you a new person. This is the purity of the gospel. Paul was upset with these people because he knew that if they would come in and they would alter the gospel, they would, they would make it about what you can do, it would be a slippery slope. And he, he's gonna, he, he talks, he's about to talk to them really straight. Paul describes the behavior of the circumcision, uh, the, the real circumcision, which is the people who have faith in Jesus, right? He says that there's three things that they do. They worship God in spirit, John 4, 23. That's what Jesus said the Father was looking for. They rejoice in Christ Jesus or they glory or they boast in not themselves, not their accomplishments, not what they've attained, not what they possess, not what they own, not what they wear, not how they look. But their boasting and their glory is in what Jesus has done for them. So that's a whole different position. So, like, I wouldn't be cocky or arrogant because of anything about me, but I would be thankful and humble because of everything that he's done. There, there's a very big difference between um, perceptions, and there can be someone who has $10 million, and he's grateful, and he knows that it was a gift from God, and he, he just didn't ever think he was that smart. He started a business, and it blew up, and he's like, how did this happen? This is God. So you could have someone who has $10 million, and they're humble, and you could have someone who has $15, and they're proud, and they say, I work for this. This is mine. Da -da 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 -da, right? And you could have someone else who is proud, who thinks they built a $10 million business. It's all on them. They're really smart. They worked hard. Me, me, me. I, I, I. And then you could have someone else who has $10 and they said, I'm just so thankful I can feed my family tonight. We'll trust God tomorrow. So it all, it all comes back down to the positioning of your heart. And so they rejoice in Christ Jesus and this is it. They have no confidence in the flesh. Jesus said this in John 15, 5, for without me you can do nothing. Very clear. Now, he basically says to, to the Philippians, according to the flesh, I am superior to you. Sometimes we, we miss that, like, because sometimes we don't read the Bible, because we, you know, like, we can be fogged out when we read the Bible and we're just like, you know, reading it. But if you ever read some of the stuff that the writers say, they, they are like real talk. And Paul is saying, if any of you guys think that you should be cocky, arrogant, or you have something like to talk about that you're something, I weigh more. That's what he says. And then he explains himself why he feels that he's better than them. And in spite of him being better than the people he's writing to, he says, I have no confidence in myself. In spite of him being better. And I, and I want to talk to you about why he thought previously he was better than them. It's important for us to see. Alright, here's the thing. You cannot walk in the truth and be dishonest. You cannot walk in love and withhold the truth from those you say you love. See, Paul was a, a man who was beaten, persecuted, tortured. He was in prison, but he had love for these people in Philippi. He, he had an affection for them. And uh, they were like really, out of all of the churches and all the places that he went to, they were the church who stuck with him the most in persecution. So when he went to prison in Rome, they were the ones who out of their pockets, like money, cash money, they supported him. They helped him financially. And so we're going to get to that next week. And there's this verse and it says that my God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. It doesn't say that in every epistle. It only says that right there. What does that mean? It means that, remember, the scriptures can never mean to us what it didn't mean to those who it was originally written to. 
So, so I'll give you next week a little bit. But the promise of God supplying all of your needs according to His riches and glory in Christ Jesus is when you stand financially with the persecuted, God promises to make His business your business. Verse 4. Now, when, remember when he said, he says, I'm from the stock of Israel. He says, I'm a Hebrew of Hebrews, all that stuff, right? This is what he's saying, verse 4. His birthright privileges. He was not a proselyte, meaning he was not converted, right? He was not a Jewish convert. In other words, he wasn't born Greek, and then he didn't go to the temple and go, okay, I believe the Jewish religion. He was born into this uh, the religion and he says uh, but a native Israelite of the stock of Israel he was of the tribe of Benjamin in which tribe is where the temple stood just listen he really when he says what he's saying he's really really has reasons to believe that he's better than them <laughs> and he was of the tribe of Benjamin in which the temple stood and which adhered to Judah when all the other tribes revolted so when all the other tribes said, screw you guys, we're not, that's it, we're not fighting, we're not doing this, we're not doing that, Benjamin was loyal to Judah. I'm going to, okay. Benjamin was the, father, was the father's darling. It was a favorite tribe. In other words, Benjamin was his father's favorite child. A Hebrew of Hebrews, an Israelite on both sides, by father and by mother, and from one generation to another. None of his ancestors had, ma uh, had matched with a Gentile. Verse 5. The tribe of Benjamin was highly regarded by Israelites because that line had produced the first king of Israel and had remained loyal to David. So he comes from a kingly lineage. What's his name? Saul of Tarsus. What was the first king of Israel's name? Saul. So he has a kingly name, right? He's from... Okay. He is... Let's say it this way. He is born in the right family. He is born in the right place. He had the right education. He had the right lineage. He had the right uh, education. He had the right history. He sat under Gamaliel, uh, a, a doctor of the law, a Pharisee, was the most respected Pharisee in those times. So it would be like you, 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 you being a lawyer under the sharpest professor uh, at Harvard or NYU. You were personally mentored by the brightest mind. So he was literally mentored by the brightest Old Testament mind, literally, that was walking the face of the earth when, 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 when he was. There's only two times where the scriptures use sitting at the feet. Mary sat at the feet of Jesus and Paul sat at the feet of Gamaliel. So he had everything going for him the right way. Everything. Okay? Uh, also, he had righteousness. He, he kept the law blamelessly. He was fully, fully committed, completely intense, so much so that he persecuted the church and he was the reason that people died. Now, let's read verse 7 and then I want to hit it real quick. But verse 7 it says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. So what that simply means is all those things that he esteemed or that he valued, he now sees them as, as three words. Loss, damage, detriment, and violence. So when he used to persecute the church in his prior life, he saw that as good because he saw that they were not keeping the law. Right? So he thought he was doing the right thing. So you have someone who has the right motives. He thinks he's really serving God. It's like some people who fly planes in the buildings. They think for certain that some of them are serving God. And they think that they're going to wake up to 72 virgins. And they wake up in hell and realize, wow. See, good motives don't save you. Jesus saves you. So this man was actively, you know, trying to do the right thing. And then he met Jesus and he began to reinterpret his life. He began to say, wow. He had, he had an awakening, right? And so the things that he thought was gain, the things that he thought were valuable, profitable, like the things that he thought he should be proud about, he realized, 
wow, these are not things to be proud about. Now, the excellency or the superior knowledge is the act of knowing of Christ. Turn Paul's value system and priorities totally upside down, or should I say right side up. The things that were gain are now dung. Now, dung is a very another, another interesting word because dung is, is what they used for the food that they feed to dogs. So Paul addresses the scavengers and he says, what I used to value is what we feed to scavengers. Everything about his prior life that he would be proud of, that he would esteem, that he would think, wow, man, I'm cool. All that stuff, worthless. All his Jewish heritage, ancestry, education, family, the right tribe, the right place, the right neighborhood, the right side of the train tracks, all of that meant nothing. Verse 9, Paul no longer wanted his own righteousness that is of the law. Now he wanted the righteousness which is of God by the faith of Jesus. Faith in what Jesus has done for him. We must always remember that it's about Jesus and about what he has done, not about what we can do. No matter how we, as a church, as we grow, as we get out in the neighborhood, as we do awesome things for people, we always must remember it's never about what we do. We only do anything good that we do as a result because God has loved us, He's chosen to save us, and He's chosen to give us vision of how we can bless others because He's blessed us. So it's never about what we can do. Verse 10, that I may know Him. That word know means to understand, to be aware of, to feel. Literally, to feel. To be sure. I may know Him in the power of His resurrection. In the fellowship of His suffering. Being conformable to His death. What does this mean? Okay, Paul is saying, by knowing Jesus as a person, by being sure of Him, by experiencing Him, by knowing Him, by being aware of Him. My whole value system, my whole priorities have been turned right side up and upside down and the things that I used to think that were valuable are worthless. 